Uh, good, good morning. I'm Tom Curry, co-chair of uh, Nutter's uh, banking practice, and uh, I want to welcome you to uh, today's uh, uh, webinar on ransomware attacks. Uh, are we, are you doing enough to protect your bank? Um, the, as a former federal and state bank regulator, I can assure you that uh, operational resilience, uh, business continuity planning, and cybersecurity preparedness are significant regulatory issues for all banks and credit unions. As U.S. Comptroller of the Currency, I also served a term as Chairman of the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council, or FFIEC. There, I first raised the need for federal and state banking agencies to provide uniform guidance on these subjects to the industry and to develop supervisory programs to assess individual firms' efforts. During my FFIEC chairmanship, we highlighted cybersecurity as a major risk and issued supervisory recommendations as early as 2015 on extortion through cyber ransomware. It remains a serious uh, issue that banks and credit unions are expected to address and remediate. Today's webinar is very timely as cyber ransomware attacks have become more widespread. We have a star panel of experts in Seth Berman, Allison Casey, and John Dornberg to guide us. Seth uh, leads Nutter's Privacy and Data Security Practice Group. Seth is re regularly assists corporations and their boards in addressing the legal and strategic aspects of data privacy laws and cybersecurity risk, and to prepare for and respond to data breaches, hacking, ransomware attempts, and other cyber attacks. Allison Casey is an associate in Nutter's litigation department and works with clients primarily on complex issues and assists Seth and Nutter's privacy and data security practice group. Seth and Allison will talk about what you and your bank should do if you are hit by a cyber uh, ransomware attempt. John Dornberg is a senior member of Gallagher's National Cyber Practice. A former corporate lawyer in New York and Boston, John works extensively with corporate general counsels and with outside legal and other advisors on cyber issues. He is also an author of white papers and other uh, content for Gallagher's cyber publications and analyzes new cyber policy endorsements uh, and helps with coverage advocacy for complex cyber claims. Before I turn it over to our panel, I wanna remind everyone that we will have time for questions and that members of the press have been invited to attend today's webinar. Allison, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Tom. Um, we wanted to begin today's discussion by going over a few recent um, ransomware attacks that you might have read about in the headlines or heard about in the news and wanted to provide some examples of what these attacks can look like. Uh, Kaseya is one of the latest ransomware um, targets. And on July 2nd, just before the 4th of July holiday, um, their I, this IT software and automation company um, was attacked by um, what was suspected to be a Russian-linked ransomware gang, R-Evil. Um, Casey's business 
um, is essentially providing software and automation services to managed service providers or MSPs. And MSPs essentially provide IT services to small and mid-sized businesses who outsource their IT support functions. So in this way, an attack on KCO was designed to be um, a downstream attack to have effects on its customers and then on the end users as well who rely on their IT services. Um, so it appears that between 50 and 60 of KCO's MSPs were hacked during the attack. Um, and that this affected approximately 1,500 businesses. Now, in the scale of things, um, KCA reports that it has about 600 MSP customers, and over the, which serve over a million customers um, downstream. So the actual um, ramifications of the attack were, were not as widespread as they could have been, but still um, a, a huge disruption. Um, one interesting aspect of this ransomware attack is that typically, um, the hackers will leak data before freezing out the targets, but this was not the case here. Um, instead, they just froze um, the services um, and before they, before they um, re requested the ransom. Um, our evil demanded between $25,000 and $150,000 from individual companies to unlock um, their data. $5 million from MSPs and a $70 million demand on KCIA to provide um, a universal decryptor code to unlock all the uh, impacted computers. Um, as of today, we know that some of the companies and MSPs have paid the ransoms, but um, KCIA has not done so at this time. Um, and interestingly, um, while known for negotiating and discounting their ransom demands, um, our evil's footprint um, disappeared on the dark web at around July 13th. So that's prompting some questions about whether there's actions being taken against this particular cyber, cyber criminal organization. Um, another attack that was um, in the news um, in, in late December of 2020 um, was the Acelion attack, which um, trickled down again, this is a downstream attack to Flagstar Bancor. Um, so Flagstar Bank is the holding company, or Bancor is the holding company for Flagstar Bank, um, which has about 150 branches throughout the Midwest. Um, and Acelion is another IT company that ironically specializes in data security. And so the specific aspect of Acelion's technology that was targeted was a file transfer appliance software. So basically how you would secure a, a transfer of, of, of data um, that you'd want to keep private and sensitive. Um, so for victims of this breach, it was like buying a safe and putting all of your most expensive jewelry in it only to have the burglars break into that safe, take the jewelry, and leave the rest of your house intact. So it targeted this very specific firewall um, software that was protecting very sensitive information. Um, you might remember that this is Celion, um, uh, breach, which affected Flagstar, um, also affected victims like the Jones Day Law Firm, um, the University of Colorado, and Kroger um, grocery stores. So it was had a lot of a lot of um, victims downstream, um, and we the the attacker was um, a newer ransomware gang that was less um, known called CLOP, um, and they again published the data. Um, and then we're making the demands for, um, for ransom. So this was a little different where the bit companies could still work and go about their business, but the attackers were trying to extort the companies with sensitive information regarding their employees um, to, to try and extract um, the ransom in this case. Then we go to um, two um, recent attacks, um, both in May of this year, Colonial Pipeline and JBS Foods, which really reflect, you know, a concerted effort on the, the part of these ransomware attackers to go after the infrastructure um, in, in the United States specifically. So Colonial Pipeline, you know, operates 
um, the biggest U.S. oil pipeline, um, and it transports the, the pipeline that was affected transports nearly half of the East Coast fuel, including gasoline, diesel, home heating oil, jet fuel, and military supplies. Um, this was linked to another Russian ransomware operation called Dark Side, and um, you know some 100 gigabytes of data were stolen and encrypted. Um, and then the company was able to um, continue its operations of the pipeline, but out of an abundance of caution, it shut down all systems until it could get the, the attack under control. Um, in this attack, the CEO authorized a $4.4 million ransom payment in Bitcoin um, because the executive reported to the Wall Street Journal, he was just unsure how badly the cyber attack breached the systems and how long it would take to get back up. Um, and interestingly, the FBI was able to recover about $2.3 million after the ransom was paid by going after the attackers. And just to comment, you know, again, on the, the, the um, significance of these attacks, the JBS food attack, JBS is the world's largest meat supplier by sales. And again, this was hit by the criminal ransomware gang, Our Evil, um, who demanded an $11 million ransom payment. Um, and so in this situation, again, JBS did pay the ransom. Um, they just felt it was necessary to, um, to get their, their business going again, um, and, and they couldn't afford not to pay. Um, so just uh, summarizing these headlines here, you know, in 2020, it's estimated that ransomware victims paid more than $406 million in cryptocurrency to attackers. And in, as of May of 2021, it's about $81 million in cryptocurrency. So we just wanted to highlight for you, you know, th th that these attacks are coming quickly, um, they're coming frequently, and it's unfortunately most likely a, a matter of, of when and not if these attacks are going to continue. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Seth, who's going to talk a little more about the trends um, with these types of attacks. All right, thank you. So um, one of the things that we've uh, seen uh, over the years is ransomware has evolved quite significantly and that both the nature of the threat and the way uh, companies are responding to it um, have changed dramatically. So over the course of the past, let's say decade or more, ransomware went from something that was really a massive uh, phishing attack. They would typically, uh, in the initial version of it, would attack um, individuals' computers essentially what would be lost would be typically the person's um, photos. Um, and then they demand a very small ransom, typically in the few hundred dollar range. And essentially the theory of the business was, uh, was sort of a mass consumer business, if you will, where they would say, okay, we're gonna attack thousands and thousands of people. Mo many of them will pay. It's only a few hundred dollars for them, but it ends up being a lot of money for us. Um, over time, the ransomware uh, attackers basically came to realize that you could make a lot more money by focusing your attentions a little less, uh, a little more uh, narrowly. Um, so they started targeting uh, companies that they felt would have little choice but to pay and started asking for ever more ransoms. This actually started a few years back, maybe about five years ago, as they started targeting healthcare, uh, particularly hospitals, um, for whom the loss of data could quickly lead to a loss of life um, and thus there was great urgency and there wasn't really the ability to rebuild systems um, and take a long time doing it if you sort of shut down the hospital's ability to track patients, track medicine and that sort of thing. So um, first uh, the demand started rising from the few hundred dollars to the few hundred for the few thousand, ultimately a few hundred thousand. We're now, as um, Allison mentioned, routinely seeing demands in the millions of dollars. And it's clear that now uh, a lot of these uh, sophisticated ransomware attacks um, they're doing a lot of research on their targets before they trigger the attack. So they may, uh, they may go in uh, to the network. They're typically in the, a network for uh, some period of weeks before they actually trigger the attack. And they're spending that time, among other things, doing research across the network for a few reasons. One is they really want to get to know you um, because they want to be able to, uh, to sort of target their demand to what they believe to be the highest amount you could possibly pay. Um, so they're not just gonna pick a large number. They're gonna pick a large number that 
they think is somehow tied to you. So I've seen some demands that seem to amount to several days worth of revenue. So they'll say, okay, this company's revenue is a you know, million dollars a day. So we're going to demand $7 million because we know it'll take them two weeks to, survive, to, to recover. So that's half, paying us is half what it's going to otherwise cost. Um, I've seen them do uh, look for people's um, insurance policies to see if they have one um, and ask for something above what the insurance will cover. Um, but knowing that there's insurance money there, this is something John will talk about a bit more in a minute. Um, and I've seen them uh, you know, really do research on Dun & Bradstreet and other places. I had a recent client um, who was attacked um, and luckily for them, the, uh, the attackers had incorrect and too low information for what the revenue was. But uh, they actually uh, announced when they demanded the money that they picked the amount because it was their annual revenue. Um, it actually was nowhere near their annual revenue, but the attackers didn't seem to realize that. So, um, the, But the idea that someone would even think that annual revenue is somehow a number that a company could actually pay um, seems to fundamentally misunderstand how businesses work. Um, the interesting thing, uh, we'll get to this a little bit more when we talk about how you actually deal with an attack, but I'll just flag right now, is that oftentimes the ask and what you actually end up negotiating to, there's quite a bit of difference between. Um, you wouldn't think this is a business that with whom you could negotiate, but uh, it turns out you can, and they're actually expecting negotiation. So one thing that's changed is the targets. They're much more focused. The demands have gotten much, much larger. And the other thing is, as companies have gotten better about doing the number one thing you could do to prevent a ransomware attack or to recover from one, which was have offline backups that couldn't also be encrypted so you could just revert to your backups, the ransomware folks uh, changed their attack to what's now called a dual threat. Um, and this is something that Allison referenced, which is now they'll steal your data and threaten to publicize it unless you pay. So sometimes clients who actually have recovered or can recover rel relatively easily from the ransomware attack itself, the ransomware, technically a ransomware attack just means an attack that, that, um, that uh, encrypts your data and holds it hostage. Um, so if you can unencrypt your data or you have a copy that's not encrypted, you could say to them, you know, we don't care. Um, so now they've, they threatened to exfiltrate your data. They give you little samples and say, we're about to make this public. If you, don't, uh, if you don't pay. And now whether you can recover or not is almost beside the point. And now there's even a few instances where there's a third threat, um, a triple threat they're calling it, which is in addition to exfiltrating data, they threaten to, uh, if you don't pay, uh, conduct a sustained DDoS attack. A DDoS attack is essentially an attack on your website that doesn't actually get at your data, but effectively shuts down your website and makes it very difficult for your for your customers to get at you on the website. Depending on what kind of business you are, obviously that could be not that bad or hugely disastrous. Um, so it's just another way of them uh, essentially trying to extort you into paying the money. Alison, can you move on to the next screen? Sure. Um, so I just wanted to discuss a little bit of the vulnerabilities of the financial industry specifically. Um, and as we were you know, mentioning, really it's, it's, that, that it's a high impact target as Seth, Seth mentioned. Um, and as we know, you know uh, now ransomware threats are, um, and attacks are going right to you know, national security interests, um, you know, as we've seen them attack core sectors of our economy and our society. And so the financial institutions definitely are a huge target. Um, and so protecting consumer data and the infrastructure of the banking system is essential to, pre to preventing widespread economic destruction um, and, and just recognizing that it's, you know, plays such a key part um, in, in everything we do as a society. Um, so financial services were the targets of 4.4% of the ransomware attacks just in the first quarter of 2021. And that was behind professional services, the public sector and healthcare. But you know, I'm sure we'll see that number continue to grow um, you know, in, in the coming years and months. Um, and you know, community banks especially may um, be targets for ransomware hackers because they might tend to have smaller security teams or limited resources to, to cope with an attack. Um, 
And then, you know, we, we do, you know, there's even some, some um, dark websites that, you know, have information published already where there's at least the credentials of one employee of a credit union or a bank um, or their vendors that's already on the dark web. So there might already be a map to kind of, you know, getting some inroads into these, um, these banks and financial institutions. Um, another vulnerability, which, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to, um, to, you know, shore up is, is reliance on third party vendors and third party um, suppliers, especially with software vendors software vendors in the financial industry. And so while a financial services firm might have extremely you know, robust cybersecurity controls and defenses, um, third and fourth parties who are performing critical services for, for your clients um, you know, will continue to um, be lucrative threats for actors um, with a variety of, of motivation. So we see these downstream or supply chain attacks, which are difficult to control. Um, and then, you know, and one other risk, um, you know, that we're currently experiencing is the, the pandemic. And so we have employees working from home. Um, and so that has forced many companies, you know, to rapidly deploy new technologies, adding to security issues. Um, and so financial institutions, um, you know, have experienced, you know, lost um, with this pandemic related cybercrime. Um, and, you know, a lot of banks and insurers um, in the U.S feel that they are less secure um, with these gaps in their corporate networks. And we've seen an increase in phishing, um, you know, emails, an increase in, you know, text um, phishing, um, they're calling it smishing, uh, you know, requests and in phone calls as well. So um, there could be a lot of incoming, um, you know, uh, requests from people that you don't know um, that could have these um, ulterior motives and these ransomware attacks behind them. Um, and so the next thing we wanted to discuss is, you know, kind of how is the industry responding in terms of, you know, guidance on these, these areas. And so, you know, there is a complex tapestry of cybersecurity guidance that has evolved in the financial industry. And each regulatory body is, is scrambling to deal with cybersecurity within their own framework and jurisdiction, um, which makes it complicated and makes it for a more piecemeal approach to responding to cybersecurity threats and, and ransomware attacks. Um, you know, over the last few years, certainly we've seen on the state level, you know, dozens of states have passed bills or resolutions related to cybersecurity. Um, if we look to specifically to regulators in, in different states, you know, New York State Department of Financial Services really stands out as promulgating cybersecurity requirements um, and kind of being a leader in this area. Um, and so, you know, the New York regulator um, was the first in the U.S. to set cyber rules for protecting consumer information held by banks and financial institutions. Um, and so if, then if we also look to the federal level, obviously we have, you know, the SEC, which has issued interpretive cybersecurity guidance, inc including specific guidance in 2018 um, with respect to customer data protection, disclosure of material um, related to cybersecurity risks and incidents, um, and, you know, gen general compliance with legal and regulatory obligations under federal securities law. Um, we also see guidance coming from the FDIC and the Office of the Comptroller of Currency, um, including a January 2020 joint statement on heightened cybersecurity risks. Um, and then, you know, we have the FBI who's working with various cyber and security, um, cybersecurity infrastructure um, organizations as well um, to, you know, give guidance on this issue. Um, they just announced that there's a, a new cyber unifi unified coordination group um, who is going to, you know, try and kind of combine some of these forces uh, to deal with this problem in a more unified approach than, than previously done. Um, of course, this month we've seen, um, you know, President Biden issue an executive order related to cybersecurity and these ransomware attacks, which will apply to, you know, government contractors. Um, so that provides, you know, additional information. Um, and then we look to the U.S. Department of the Treasury's office, um, and you know, on October 1st of 2020, um, the Office of Foreign Asset Control (OFAC) um, issued an advisory to companies about providing services to victims of ransomware attacks, informing them of the potential sanctions risk for facilitating ransomware payments. 
And so I think this is where Seth's going to um, talk about the last uh, point on this slide about the payments of, of ransomware demands. Yeah, so one of the things I think that's uh, most uh, interesting and, and worrisome about ransomware is that, um, just to take a step back, it's, it's really a great crime from the perspective of the criminal. Um, you know, the amount of money that you could make in a ransomware attack so far exceeds the amount of money you could make in a real world attack with far less risk. So from a bank's perspective, you know, the risk that someone walks into the bank and tries to do an old fashioned uh, bank heist, right? The amount of money you could lose in a bank heist is nothing like the amount you could lose in a ransomware attack. And the odds of getting caught for the, for the um, attackers is so low. And the flow of money seems to be increasing dramatically. So what that's done is there's kind of a, a, a scattered response to date of various uh, parts of the government to say, you know, gee, this is really a problem. And the reality is every time someone pays a ransom, they're fertilizing the ground for the next ransomware attack because you're just encouraging the ransomware attackers to keep going. So no one quite knows what to do about it. Unfortunately, at times, the government has said things that people interpreted to mean it was fine to pay ransoms. Um, the FBI, some years ago, someone, I think in their personal capacity, um, gave a speech in which he said something like, the FBI doesn't think you should pay these, but understands you may not have a choice, which got interpreted as the FBI says it's okay. Um, and um, I, I see that quoted a lot. It drives the FBI crazy because they def definitely never meant to say that and they don't think it's a good idea to pay ransoms. Um, the reality is that most people feel like they don't have much choice as we've seen in some of the examples we've talked about. So what we're seeing is that different regulatory agencies within the government are trying to use their pre-existing authority to say something about ransomware. And OFAC, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, um, which, uh, as I'm sure you all know, can, uh, you know, has rules about who you can and can't uh, deal with. Um, for example, terrorists and drug dealers and people like that are on the list. And U.S. banks and other and other individuals are not allowed to uh, to transact with these people. Um, OFAC came out with a statement about ransomware payments, and what the statement said was two things. One was, you know, if someone's on the OFAC list and you pay them ransomware well, then you're in violation of the OFAC rules, and that's a crime. Um, that everyone knew. Um, what they also said was something else that everyone knew, but it wasn't clear what they meant, which was, remember, it's a strict liability crime. So even if you look and you don't think the person's on the, the uh, OFAC list, but they actually are, and you deal with them, that's also a crime. Well, that latter thing puts people in a tough position, because remember, when you're attacked by ransomware, you don't really know who did it. So the newspapers report it as if these gangs were sort of like known individuals. It's our evil or it's Klopp or whoever it is. But really what that's saying is that's a strand of ransomware, not an individual. And we believe that the same group of individuals are behind the different types of ransomware. So what we're really saying is our company was attacked by a type of ransomware, which is typically used by a group we call our evil. That's a bit different than saying we're actually dealing with this particular group. And even if we are, we don't actually know who's in the group. We don't know if it's North Korea, if it's a criminal gang in Russia, if it's a government somewhere, we have no idea. So when you go and look to pay ransoms, what responsible people do is they go and, uh, and actually check the OFAC list to see whether or not their group they think they're dealing with is on there. And more importantly, to see whether or not the sp specific Bitcoin or cryptocurrency wallet that they've been instructed to pay to is on there. But the thing is, effectively, it never is. And the reason it never is, is that if the, um, if the OFAC puts a cryptocurrency wallet on the, uh, on the OFAC list, not only do we find that out, but the attackers find that out too. So they go and get a different cryptocurrency wallet. So I've never heard of a situation where someone actually put a cryptocurrency wallet uh, address that was already on the OFAC list. That would just be crazy. Um, so you go and look and inevitably, or you know, in almost all circumstances, you find that they're not on the list. And now the question is, but could they be secretly North Korea or someone else I'm not supposed to be dealing with? And if so, am I gonna get in trouble if I deal with them? The answer to that is not so easy to know. 
Um, and it's sort of tied up in this idea that different uh, parts of the government are sort of issuing guidances and suggestions that don't necessarily match what's going on in the world or even what other government agencies are doing. And I'll say one last thing on this, which is uh, I do think that this is something that is evolving. And I think that the, uh, the Biden administration is actually working to unify that. Um, they have much more high profile positions within the White House focused on cybersecurity and focused on unifying the guidance across agencies. I think we're gonna see, we're already seeing it starting and we're gonna see more of a unified US approach to doing this as opposed to the SEC having one approach and the FTC another and OFAC yet another. Um, I, but we're not quite there yet. So we're still seeing sort of a splintering of suggestions for different groups that don't always compute with each other. Can we move to the next slide? All right, so this is the uh, slide where we're gonna talk through about how you deal with an actual attack. So because I'm a lawyer, I'll start with the thing that's most lawyerly about it, um, which is the legal privilege. So, you know, as soon as you face an attack, um, a, a few things uh, become obvious, right? So from a, a corporate perspective, you have a serious problem on your hands um, and that's gonna impact your clients, your revenue, your business in possibly every way, depending on how significant the attack is. From a legal perspective, um, it should be immediately obvious that you have a serious legal problem on your hands as well. Um, and that legal problem is likely to lead to uh, notification obligations. You're gonna have to tell people this happened. Um, for banks, you're probably gonna have to tell your customers, anyone whose information was included, obviously your banking regulators um, and others. Um, and then on top of that, there's very likely to be a whole series of litigation, depending on what happens, but often uh, a series of litigation by uh, the different people who might be involved in an attack. So um, the, uh, the victims of an attack go far beyond the company that's attacked. It includes their customers. Um, if there's credit card information on there, uh, other banks may uh, feel that they've been victimized by this or the credit card um, uh, networks. Um, there have been uh, class action lawsuits involving those. Um, there have been class action lawsuits involving um, customers, involving um, shareholders. So, you know, you're sort of immediately in a situation where it's likely ultimately this will lead to a, a lawsuit. So given that, you have to be mindful of the legal privilege issue. This is probably one of the most dynamic areas of law um, around cyber attacks right now. Um, so it is a little bit unclear how much of the investigation can be uh, can be conducted under privilege. It's clear that uh, if the investigation is run by the IT group uh, within your company, it's not, it's not protected by the privilege. If it is done for your lawyers so that your lawyers can defend the case, it is. The problem is in real life, it's usually a combination of the two. Um, and there are some ways around it, much too technical to get into in this um, conversation, but but it's worth saying you want to get your lawyers involved as early as possible. Um, you want to think through what parts can or should be privileged. Um, and then you really need to uh, both make sure you're, you've structured it uh, and, uh, and followed that structure to try to protect the privilege so you don't end up creating a roadmap of what went wrong um, for plaintiff's attorney uh, in some future class action. So that's, uh, that's one thing. Um, the next thing to know is that um, ransomware uh, has evolved on both sides of the ledger. Both the, uh, the attackers um, and the responders um, have spawned a sort of very complex series of what I guess I'll call businesses. So on the attacker side, you think of it as there is an attacker who is coming into my system and demanding a ransom. But in fact, actually, even there, it has specialized. It turns out that the people who create the, uh, who find the vulnerabilities and create the, uh, the mechanisms to get in the company are different from the people who create the actual ransomware. That in turn is different from the people who actually trigger the ransomware and negotiate your demand. Um, and sometimes um, there are even more layers involved. These groups all sort of work together. Um, there's a ransomware as a service now where you can essentially rent out ransomware and share in the profits as you attack different people. Um, so there's a whole industry on the attack side. There's actually a whole industry on the response side too. 
So I've been doing this for um, you know about 15 years now. And early on, there were really only one or two players, um, forensics folks who would help you um, respond to an attack, understand what happened. Those players still exist, but in addition to your digital forensic provider who's going to do a deep dive incident response investigation to understand what's going on, how can you recover, what was stolen. There are other players too. There's insurance that John will talk about. Um, there are people who specialize in notifications, both on the law firm side and also um, there are uh, companies that all they do is send out notifications and man 800 numbers so that people can call in. There are actually people who specialize in negotiating with the ransomware attackers. Um, and, uh, and in actually, they're the ones who ultimately uh, are the last step in paying the ransom. Uh, they typically have their own uh, cryptocurrency wallets. Uh, they, uh, they're the ones who actually pay the, the ransomware folks. It's a, um, a very strange business. It's sort of disturbing uh, morally, I suppose, that it exists at all. Um, but they're extremely good at what they do. So when you deal with them, because they negotiate with these uh, attackers every day, they really know the attackers. And they'll be able to say, okay, we negotiated with our evil 15 times in the last month. And typically, you know, they're gonna ask for a ransom. If you need uh, the key within a week, we can get you about 50% off. If you can hold on for three weeks, we can probably get you 90% off. Or they'll say, you know, we've negotiated with these people and sometimes they don't actually, you pay and they don't give you the key. So you may not want to do that. Or, or they always give the key. Um, the ransomware people actually, the, uh, most of them actually sort of have customer service too. After they give you the key, they'll help you figure out how to use it. What they say when you say, how can we trust you is, well, this is just a business to us. It's not personal. And if we don't decrypt it, the next person won't pay and we'll be out of business. Um, that is uh, obviously not always true. And you're sort of relying on deeply unethical uh, people to follow a certain code of ethics, um, which doesn't always happen, but it happens more often than you would think. Um, so that le leads you to the sort of, do you pay or do you not pay? Um, and that question is really hard to answer. Um, I think companies often find themselves feeling like they don't have much choice. Um, and it's not even clear what the right thing to do is. Um, in addition to the fact that you, you, know, you may be looking at months of lost revenue, um, there's also the problem of what happens when they've stolen your data and they're threatening to make it public. Do you have an obligation to, to your customers, to others to, uh, to pay so as to keep that from becoming public? It's pretty hard to know the answer to that. Um, you, you quickly get yourself into a situation where you know, a team of ethicists could debate it forever as to whether or not paying or not paying is the right thing to do. And while it's easy to say on a societal level that we'd be better off not negotiating with terrorists, it's a lot easier to do that when you're, you're not the hostage. Um, when you're the hostage saying, shoot the hostage and I'm not gonna pay is a little harder to do. Um, so it's really not clear what to do. I think in the long run, um, we're gonna move, we as a society are probably gonna move to a system to make payments either harder or impossible to try to cut this off but we're not there yet. Um, and so now as it sits on the sort of conscience of the management of a bank or other institution that's facing it, you're gonna have to work that through with yourself, your lawyers, your board, um, as you try to decide what the right thing to do is. And then involving law enforcement um, is definitely something that uh, you wanna talk with your lawyers over. There are some issues with it. In the banking context, I would say 99% of the time you're gonna involve law enforcement early um, because uh, just given the nature of what you do, um, the doing so um, often doesn't, uh, doesn't trigger a lot of reaction um, from law enforcement other than them saying that they'll keep an eye on it. Um, but sometimes there are things they can do. Um, it's certainly helpful for them to understand what's going on around, uh, around the world with these attacks. And in, in most instances, it's probably the right thing to do both for yourself so you can tell people you're cooperating with law enforcement um, and also for, uh, for sort of our collective defense um, to keep law enforcement informed about what's going on. And then in the aftermath of an attack, there's a whole series of things to worry about. So obviously you have to rebuild your systems and get yourself back online. But in addition to that, there are various reporting requirements that can be um, a serious burden. 
Um, I've almost never been involved in a uh, incident like this where there wasn't weeks and weeks after the incident, even after the company had sort of nominally recovered in the sense that systems were back online, it was able to go back to business where it wasn't dealing with a massive investigation to try to understand whose data may have been involved, who do we have to notify? And this inevitably leads to recriminations when six or eight or 12 weeks after the incident, you're going and informing people, we're sorry to tell you that your social security number was, was hacked. Everyone's response is, how could it have taken so long? This incident happened in February and you're just telling me now, how could that be? Um, and you know, for those of us in the business, the answer is it's not so simple. When an attack happens, we don't really know what was stolen. We don't know whose data was involved and we don't know your address, so we can't tell you. But no one who's receiving those notices sees it that way. They see it as you've known about this for three months and you haven't told anyone. You know, that's even worse than the attack itself. Um, so there's that problem. There's obviously serious PR problems. And then the ongoing litigation risk I mentioned at the beginning. I think with that, we turn it over to John. Isn't that right, Allison? Yep. Thanks. John? Thanks, Seth. As you've heard, ransomware attacks impose many different kinds of losses and costs. What makes ransomware different is that it cuts across and involves most of the different coverages in your cyber insurance policy. So a cyber policy can help you pay for the costs involved in getting help, uh, your, your legal and forensic providers, um, that those are covered by a ransomware policy. And an important point is you want to be absolutely sure to get your preferred providers approved by the primary insurer when you buy the policy and not wait till an incident happens. Some policies and some insurers are very restrictive about who they'll allow to serve as your legal breach counsel or your forensics firm. Um, most are pretty flexible. One major policy form requires you to use their providers and you can generally get your preferred lawyers and forensic firms approved if you do it at the time the policy is placed. So that's very important. The, um, the policy can help you pay, as Seth and Allison have discussed, for the costs involved in resolving the ransomware attack. That in includes the engagement of experts, um, the negotiation and payment of the ransom, all of which needs to be done with insurer approval. Um, and as we'll discuss in a second, the cost of the ransom itself is often, in fact, mostly quite minor relative to the overall cost to the insurer and to you of recovering from a ransomware attack. And an interesting point, uh, Allison and Seth mentioned the OFAC issues. When we talk to insurers, they say roughly one to 3% of their claims have uh, involved cases where they couldn't pay because of OFAC issues. So it comes up a lot. Service providers know how to do the investigation and it has not impeded ransom payments so far. The policy can help you cover the cost of getting back up and running, network restoration and data recovery. It can reimburse you for lost revenues because of the business interruption and the extra expenses that you incur. It can cover the costs of dealing with affected individuals and other parties, the notification costs, credit monitoring and public relations costs. And as you've heard, with the exfiltration of data now common in ransomware attacks, you're likely gonna have notification issues anytime you suffer an incident. And of course, the cyber policy can help you deal with costs of claims um, from affected individuals, from others, and as well as claims and investigations by regulatory authorities. Because there is so much coverage, Ransomware has had a significant impact on the cyber insurance market. Uh, prices have gone up dramatically. It's now routine for renewals to have increases of 20 to 60% or more. Um, insurers are imposing sublimits on how much they'll pay for ransomware attacks. That's 
you buy a $5 million policy, you may get two and a half million dollars of coverage for all the different costs involved in a ransomware attack. Not, that's not universal by any means, but it's increasingly the case. Some insurers, one major insurer requires co-insurance. You have to pay, um, in this case, 50% of the costs of resolving a ransomware attack. Other insurers are imposing exclusions on certain types of attacks uh, if you have any kind of solar winds exposure, there's at least one insurer that imposes an exclusion for that. An insurer has also imposed an exclusion for any attack involving end of life software. And most importantly, ransomware attacks have affected the availability of insurance. We used to be able to confidently go out to not that many insurers for a placement. Now we routinely go to 20 to 30 insurers on your behalf. The important point to take away from this is that you've got to start very early on your insurance placement or renewal. We look to begin a good four months before the renewal date. You have to approach many different insurers. You have to go back and forth on the application process. We routinely have a conversation with clients before they complete the application to answer their questions about it, after they complete the application to point out any potential inconsistencies or suboptimal app uh, answers, and after they edit the application uh, before we submit it to the, to the carriers. All this takes time. Something else that you ought to do is approach the major companies that do external vulnerability scans, such as BitSight and Security Scorecard, and, and try to get the report on your organization. They'll often make those available. These reports typically have errors, um, things that you've resolved, um, websites that are no longer yours, and insurers rely on these in underwriting accounts. And it's, it's helpful to get those if you can and deal with the, the bureau that's done them, the company that's done them to try to resolve any errors in reports so that they don't affect your insurance renewals. Insurance underwriters have ramped up their underwriting of all companies. It's like property insurers where you have to have sprinklers in order to get insurance. Now, Things like multi-factor authentication have gone from nice to have to an absolute requirement. It's virtually impossible to get cyber insurance if you don't have multi-factor authentication for all remote access, for all privileged accounts, and for all cloud-based emails at, at a minimum. Carriers look at your controls in a few main areas. What do you do to keep attackers in malware out of your system? They'll look at MFA, multi-factor authentication, patching cadence, how often do you do patches? How well do you and frequently do you train your employees? Do you utilize end of life software? They'll look at what you do to detect and prevent network intrusions. Uh, including vulnerability scans and endpoint detection and response solutions. They'll look at what you do to limit the attacker's lateral movement within your network. Do you segregate your networks? How do you manage privileged accounts? And uh, they'll look at how you respond to an incident. Do you have uh, both an incident and a ransomware response plan? How what about your data recovery? What about your business continuity plans? How often do you back up? How often do you try restoring from backups? Have you tried a complete res restoration from backup? Because that can take a long time and be much more difficult than a partial backup. So I was thinking about what you can do to best prepare for a successful placement. And I, I tried doing something similar to what they say about the three most important things are in real estate. And what I came up with 
are adaptation, preparation, and synchronization. Show that you have a culture of changing your practices and your security controls to keep current with evolving threats and security responses. Frameworks such as the NIST framework are very useful in demonstrating to the insurers that you have a culture of cybersecurity. Preparation, you need to put the time in throughout the placement process to answer questions fully with elaboration and nuance. Uh, applications typically call for yes, no answers and your IT and security people will tell you the answers are most often yes, but no and, or that depends. So uh, elaborate and synchronize among all the various players who have their hands in this particular pie. Everyone needs to know their roles, both internally and externally. Um, you want to keep them in their lanes and you want to make sure that the different players play well together and that you're, you're presenting insurers with a consistent picture of what you do to protect yourself from a ransomware attack. Financial institutions such as banks are used to dealing in, in a regulatory and compliance-based environment. And this is a good example of how that comes to fruition. Your lawyers are very well placed to help you navigate this because they're familiar with the legal and compliance issues. They're familiar and conversant with the technical issues and they know how to deal with regulators and others. So you're already living in this world and um, banks have typically been early adopters of cyber insurance. Um, your regulatory framework requires you to protect data. And so this is just ramping it up a few notches and you're typically in a good spot to get the best possible deal. Okay. Allison and Seth. Uh, Seth, I think we. Sorry, I was on mute there for a second. Um, okay, so our last slide here is really on thinking about what comes next, right? So um, this is a, a dangerous thing. We're going to make predictions about the future. So, um, you know, we're in an interesting moment with ransomware. I think there's a, a realization um, that has become clear in the last probably six months that ransomware is not just a, a, a problem for the victim company or even the victim company and the people who are affected by it, like its customers or its employees. But actually it's a systemic risk for the economy. Um, we certainly saw that with the uh, Colonial Pipeline um, incident where suddenly there was a fear that, that the whole economy or the whole East Coast was gonna run out of oil. Um, and you could easily imagine that spinning into a massive uh, economic crisis that goes far beyond the ransomware itself. So what this means is that a few things um, are happening. One is uh, actually one thing interesting about the colonial pipeline attack was that almost immediately after it happened, the people who, the, the, the group behind it issued a statement saying, oops, we didn't mean to do anything that bad. You know, we're going to be careful. Don't, you know, we'll just pay us some kind of ransom and we'll move on and we won't attack anything so bad again. Um, I'm sure that was a lie. But what's interesting about it is that they felt they needed to lie, which tells me that um, at a minimum, the ransomware actors do understand that they can go too far. And if they go far enough, governments will do things that will make their lives very miserable. Um, so I don't actually think given the fractured nature of who's behind these, that they will stop the process of going too far. So therefore I suspect that things will actually get worse before they get better. But I do think that the ransomware actors may be onto something, which is that at some point, this is, this is not sustainable. And ultimately things that are not sustainable don't get sustained. So one way or another, this will, this will eventually get better, but I think it's gonna get a lot worse before it gets better. So um, what are governments doing? So governments, um, among other things, uh, we've seen a few major things like right after the, um, 
the attack on um, Colonial Pipeline, the uh, the company or the the ransomware group that was behind it went offline. Um, not clear what that was about. It may have been them reforming as a different group um, just because the temperature got too high. Uh, they might have been pushed to shut down. They might have been attacked. It's not clear. As Allison mentioned, the government went and uh, essentially took their Bitcoin wallet, something that had never really been done before. Um, sadly, the price of Bitcoin had fallen. So although the government recovered, I think it was something like 80% of the Bitcoin that had been delivered, it was worth a lot less by the time the government seized it. Um, but um, that was interesting um, and something that we, we haven't seen before. And then um, with uh, the R Evil group, you know, something really interesting happened that none of us understand, which is um, the R Evil suddenly went, went dark. And it's not clear if that happened because uh, they decided to go dark, which I think is unlikely because they hadn't collected all their ransoms. If the US government took them down, which is a definite possibility, there's a, also a possibility that the Russian government took them down um, and that uh, Biden's kind of threats to Putin that if you don't get control of the actors working from your soil, we will take drastic action against you. But we really don't know what happened. What we do know is that some of the victims were sort of left in the lurch when it happened because uh, they now had no way to pay the ransom or if they had paid the ransom, they had no way of getting the decryption key. Um, so what, it's not always so easy when they're taken down as to whether or not that's better or worse for the victim. And then I think John is gonna to touch very briefly on what he thinks is going on uh, with insurers in the future. Maybe just a couple sentences on that so we have some time for a Q and A. John? Um, well, primarily they are raising prices and restricting coverage. Uh, there's a lot of talk about not paying the ransom itself. One major insurer has announced it won't pay ransoms in France. Um, that's still a fraction of the overall cost to insurers. And they're tweaking the wording in ways that may not be obvious, but you have to be careful uh, about in policies to potentially limit some significant coverages. All right, I think we have a few questions. Tom, let me turn it over to you so that you can. Yeah, uh, yeah. thank you, uh, Seth, Allison, and uh, John for your presentation. Oh, we just have a few minutes. Uh, maybe we could do one or two questions quickly. Um, Seth, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the need to or the requirement to notify law enforcement. Uh, could you tell us what, what they could do actually to help or not help? Yeah. So most of the time when you notify law enforcement, um, one of the ways you do that is through uh, the FBI has a website, um, which is called IC3. Um, when you uh, when you input an IC3 report, you have now officially reported it to the FBI, and that's probably the last you'll ever hear of it. Um, so doing that is useful um, if you want to say you talk to law enforcement, but it doesn't actually typically, you don't immediately see a reaction to that. Going on in the background there, using that to build more intelligence about what's going on and use that to build cases, but they don't come swooping in to help you. For bigger attacks where the, you're dealing more directly with the FBI, there are some things they can do. Sometimes they can give you some intelligence about what's happened with other people, um, maybe some information about the malware itself. Occasionally they'll actually call you and tell you they think you're about to be the victim of an attack. Um, we have now seen, uh, as I highlighted a minute ago, um, some pretty drastic actions apparently by the government to shut down attackers. Um, this is definitely good for society. As I mentioned, whether it's good for the victim is a little bit less clear if you end up getting frozen out of your attackers because the attacker gets taken down. Um, I think this is a, a question that we will need to revisit in, uh, in six mm -hmm. months or a year because I think that the answer is going to change um, as the, uh, the FBI and others are changing their tactics getting more aggressive in their responses. Um, and uh, it, it may affect how they approach these things and what it means for companies when they talk to the FBI. Yeah, thank you, Seth. Uh, uh, John, uh, maybe you can answer one question. We have a minute left, so I'll put the pressure on you. Um, you know, uh, when it comes to selecting a, uh, a cyber insurer, um, you know, are all the policies the same? What should a, a bank or a credit union be looking for when they're selecting a, a cyber insurer? Um, the policies of top insurers are not the same by any means. No insurer has the best coverage in all areas across the board. Um, it's important that each bank decide what's most important to it 
and try to find and improve the policy with the best overall combination. Wording is really important. All policies say they have regulatory coverage, but when you delve into the wording, many of them don't cover a lot of the obligations imposed by the new wave of privacy laws that impose a lot of affirmative obligations in addition to breach, uh, to breach prevention. Uh, the wording of war exclusions and others matters a great deal. So you have to decide what's most important to you and use that as the base for picking the best overall combination of cost and coverage. Thank you, John, for the question. We're, we've run out of time, but I want to close by, again, thanking our panelists, uh, Allison Casey, John Dornberg, and Seth Berman. Uh, thank you. Have a great day.